Eve is centuries old, and she does not seem at all jaded by life. She lives literally surrounded by books in Tangier, like a modern-day Paul Bowles. She has perspective, and her books give her company, and with a little perspective and good company, I reckon uh, you can hold the jadedness at bay. And if you are, as she is, 3,000 years old, she's a Brooke Terry druid, by the way, um, um, you don't sweat the small, the medium, the big stuff. You just keep looking up and uh, waiting for the stars to do something interesting at right. some point. You know, it's, uh, it's called perspective, I reckon. Because she lives in this world of literature and prose in a relatively isolated part of the world as far as the West. So she is not having to endure the rigors of modernity, which she eventually has to do when she moves to Detroit for a while. So is Eve content? Well, I take issue with the idea that, that Tangier is not modern. I mean, in many ways, it's the most modern place I can think of. It's like a kind of hotspot for any culture from any planet you can imagine. Uh, everyone is passing through uh, from every century you can imagine. I mean, Paul Bowles and William Burroughs are still there as far as I'm concerned, right. if not Christopher Marlowe. Uh, it's all happening there. Right. Um, so I would suggest that in a way she's living a more modern kind of vibe than he is. He's, he's holding the world at bay, right. but she's in it. You know, she's, she's, she likes people. She's, she's not put off them. She's up for it all. And it's, it's right what you say, she does adapt. But she's got kind of bent knees. She's, you know, she's surfing. So by comparison, Adam has found himself in Detroit, which, as you know, is one of the roughest parts of America. He could not have found perhaps a more terrifying patch of the, of the 50 to exist in. It, it's a tough town. A lot of people have moved. He lives in a really kind of forsaken patch of the earth. Um, he seems to be not having as good a time as, as, as Eve is with humanity. But he's very young. <laughs> a mere 500 years old. He's, he's, he's got a lot to learn, and he's, uh, he, he, he's got so much invested in putting up these walls and being a curmudgeon and basically uh, investing in being in a, in a bad mood. Uh, Give him a couple of thousand years and he might get there. The, there's a, a moment where he dispatches Ian, his fixer, to procure him a wooden-tipped bullet. Mm. And we presume so he can kill himself. How could he leave Eve? Because obviously they are lovers, good friends. Hardly anyone on the planet knows what they know. It's a great secret they have together, a great knowledge. How could he leave her? First time I saw the bullet, I was like, really? You really want to leave this? So as Eve, because obviously you see the bullet, so there is this scene in the film where did you feel betrayed by Adam? I mean, it's hard to fathom, but you know, he does, he does leave the gun where she can find it. So uh, you could say he's... Um He's a little, he's got the drama queen around the edges, you know? <laughs> and, um, yeah, he's, he, he, he doesn't dissuade her from coming to save him. It's kind of the routine, I reckon. Well, uh, here's the thing that I, I was trying to figure out. Conventional couples, or people who are together, if they are devoted to one another, they might have time away from each other a day or in extraordinary circumstances, a week, a month. But if you have, presumably, eternity to be together, time apart could be, like a weekend to myself, could be for decades, right? My question is, why are two people, two vampires, two immortals who are in love with each other, why are they living at almost opposite ends of the world? Well, why wouldn't they? Um, they've got nothing to lose, and uh, they're very different. 
You know, there, there's something really beautiful about the fact that these two people who really, really like each other um, are so different from one another. They're, I mean, the, I have to tell you, if you don't know this, that the, the first kind of grain in this oyster uh, for Jim was Mark Twain's beautiful diaries of Adam and Eve, uh, which are kind of fictional or not diaries of the original Adam and Eve. And they're so beautiful. The, 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 the way in which this was the original grain was to show a long, long marriage between two people who are so different from one another. He's this curmudgeon stumping around the garden saying, Wednesday, I've got to name all these animals. And he's really, really <laughs> bad mood constantly. And she's this space cadet who just appears from nowhere, in fact, out of his side, saying, oh, the stars, I want to put them in my hair, you know. And, um, she throws rocks at them to try yeah, and dislodge she, them from she, the sky. And, and she wants to make rhinoceroses domestic pets and, 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 and all that good stuff. And they love each other forever. They are completely coming from two different angles and they are devoted to one another forever. And I love that. I love the fact that Jim chose to place at the heart of this story this, like, this endless interest between these two complete aliens. Because they are in love, and when you have eternity and you trust each other, you can just take your hands off it and not fear that it's going to go astray. Is yeah, that the idea? Yeah, because you're not going to mess with one another. You're not going to try and edit each other into some version of you. You're not, it's not romance, you know, come together in oneness and then the end on the screen. Uh, like some vampire films. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's about the long haul. It's about the long, long life and being so interested in somebody and going, man, you're super weird, but I really am interested in you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch you being weird to me and keep you company. So, so basically, it's a love story mm. at its core. Mm. It, to me, what I, when I saw it a few days ago, it just spoke of the permanence and the strength of love, because uh, no doubt over the centuries for, uh, for Adam and for you, thousands of years, there's nothing that you two haven't seen from plague, where food items were hard to procure, but you adapted and you survived, and you both end up being incredibly articulate, sensitive creatures. I just think surviving things is kind of good for the soul, you know, keeping going and, and, and managing to prevail. And managing to prevail in good company, you know, going through things together, that in itself is quite a kick and probably, right. probably makes you closer. Well, mortals, usually well, in a life, there's maybe one to three things that they look back and go, can't believe I got through that. You know, a car accident or some awful thing. But in your life, you'd be able to say, well, yeah, Genghis Khan, he was a drag. Yeah, and the true. bubonic plague wasn't cool, yeah. the potato famine. I yeah. mean, there's all these things you can reference yeah. where barely got through that. Yeah. And so the Nietzschean axiom of what does not kill you makes you stronger. Uh, you and Marlowe and Adam all seem to have wisdom to burn. They're pretty humane vampires. I mean, they're super evolved. They're as close as Jim would like them to have been vegetarian, but you know, they're they're as close to vegetarian as they could be. Um, and they're, you know, trying to keep rolling and evolving, and um, and uh, trying to retain some kind of compassion for human beings who are testing the limits. Right. Yeah, it's it's a tough moment. And and Adam, who has outright contempt for humanity. They're zombies. I would expect that he would be dis become disgusted with actually killing live humans for blood because he re it would remind him of what they do to each other, and he would find it repellent, where centuries before, that's just kind of how you, you got fed, and ultimately, you must revert back to it. There's a thing that happens over and over in the film that I'm sure you've been asked about a million times. The blood has a narcotic effect on the vampires. It, it, I don't know really anything about heroin, but it, it looks like <laughs> when someone takes the, takes the, 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 the rope off the arm and, and the, the, bl the blood with the heroin hits the body, there's the sag. All of you, you take the shot of blood and there's that euphoric kind of loss of consciousness for a moment, and that's displayed several times. Well, it's nourishment. 
you know, it does feed them and it keeps them living, which can't be said of all opiates, but um, it has a good feeling for them. And it's true, there are all sorts of things that people do privately, um, you know, when the, the, the knights are drawing in um, by themselves that make them kind of fall back against sure. cushions, but they aren't... Uh, um, <laughs> they aren't... Uh, uh, you know, some, some of those things are good for you and feed you, and some, some of those things don't necessarily... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's all in there. I mean, it's, it, it, it could, though, be a really, really good bar of chocolate.